first take, what are some of the things you notice both about the content, what he's saying, and also about the way he goes about saying it? Just one, a quick, a quick phrase, or what, what words or phrases stick out to you here? Yes. Well, there's some old biblical references. <clears throat> yeah, he calls in the Bible a lot, absolutely. Which we know is strange for us in the 21st century. It, and he also, it's clear he assumes people know that those quotes are from the Bible, right? Because he doesn't say these are Bible quotes. He just does it. What else? He begins talking about, you know, why he said some things at the first local address and how this is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's, he definitely starts off by saying this is a new day, this is a different time. Absolutely. What else? What, do you, what, what other things do you notice in here? Yeah. Malice toward none is going to start the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so at the very end of the speech, he's definitely moving forward and he's setting a tone for what his expectations are. Absolutely. What else? I think he reaffirms the notion that as we've seen since the Emancipation Proclamation that originally the war was about preserving the Union, but now he's very clear that it was about ending slavery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, he really, he states it. And he even goes further than that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. What else? What else do you notice? Anything about the structure? Yes. I'm just struck by the <clears throat> rather severe comment that God wills the retribution. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing light or uh, casual about this middle paragraph. Anything else? Okay, let's try to take a second pass at this. And as we're doing it, I want you to think about those things, about the references, the biblical references. And, and let's also, we'll, we'll pay attention to these different paragraphs. He starts by saying it's a new day. Then he goes into talking about what it was like in the country at the beginning of the Civil War in the next paragraph. And then he goes into this really intense paragraph about um, slavery and about why this war, why he's, he's got a, an idea of why this war happened. And then moving us towards, towards post-war time. And just quickly, I want to remind you, do you all know <coughs> what the day was that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated? Do you remember? April 15th. April 14th. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was assassinated on the 14th. He died on the 15th. And what is this date right here? March 4th. March 4th. So it's how much earlier? Yeah, just like a month and a half. It's not much. He, he, he hardly had a second term. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential <coughs> office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement somewhat detailed of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, the expiration of four years during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point in the phrase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, Little that is new can be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. Okay, let's stop for a second and talk about some of the things he's doing in this first paragraph. It's funny, I, I've been doing this for three years and I just noticed a new thing. So what what are some of, he's very skilled in the way he's structuring this. What are some of the things that he's doing in this first paragraph? How is he, what, what is he trying to do as he introduces this speech? What do you see? Well, with high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to his venture, but he has a plan. He's mm -hmm. just not quite sure how it's going to go yeah. and how it's going to be accepted. Yeah, and you know, I, that's the part that I just noticed something for the first time. He doesn't ever say in this speech, and the Union is going to win, which was clear by them. It was clear by March 4th that the un Union was going to win. Why wouldn't he say that? What, why might he choose not to say that in this speech, given what else he does? He feels he's the president of all the states. He doesn't want to, to stick it to the South. He's specifically saying, no prediction is ventured. I'm not going to go there. It's, it's an interesting way for him to start that speech. So he's already thinking about healing. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, we're not. I'm not going to start this speech by saying we're go. You know, we're winning. We're doing it. Well, well even the sense before that. reasonably satisfactory. He doesn't go and jump and say we we won. Pretty much. It's very. Yeah. It's um, humble. Yeah. Mm hmm. You. I, I just heard. I'm sorry. Very I don't humble. know. Yes. Yeah. And very measured. <coughs> He's very careful how he goes next. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. Paul dreaded it, Paul sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of those would make war rather than let, let the nation survive. The other would accept war rather than let it perish. And war, the war came. Okay, let's stop again. Um, he's still talking about the previous inauguration and the beginning of the war here. And he does a lot of this then and now. If you notice, at the very, in the first paragraph, he says, then a statement um, seems fitting and proper. Now, it, we don't need it anymore. So, so what do you notice about this paragraph? What are some of the things you notice about, about what he's saying at this paragraph? I'm going to say one. Do, are there any hands back there that I'm missing? Yes. OK, sorry. OK, it just seems like it's very balanced. He's not placing blame. And you know, the, the last two sentences, he, he speaks of what one party did, what the other party did, and then the response one party did, and the other party did. So he's, very, mm -hmm. he's trying to just give a very balanced perspective. And what's the, uh, this is just a little grammar thing that I sometimes do with kids when I'm looking at this. In that very last clause of the paragraph, who's taking the action? The war itself. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's not a person on either That's side. Right. It's the war is the subject. And he, he also does a similar thing by saying that insurgent agents, he's not saying the whole South, the yeah. government, of, you know, or yeah. the leaders of the South, he, he like agents, like it, I know it's not everyone, it was just these few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he also says in that second sentence, notice the way he says, all dreaded it, all sought to avert it. Nobody wanted war. I think he does nail though, who he feels started it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's he true. It clear. It's true. He said one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept it. Um, no, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, he's not saying nobody's responsible here, but he is really being careful about the way he phrases it. Yeah. Um, you're ready to keep going? Okay. Okay. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To, to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial margin of it. OK, I'm going to stop us here, because this is a really long paragraph. Um, what's he doing here? He's moving on from talking about the what happened at the beginning and who was responsible. He's going a little deeper here. What's he doing? He's kind of always said that you know the, the cause of the war was to save the union, save the union. Mm -hmm. But here he's saying that even though we always said it was to save the union, we knew that this was slavery and sensitivity yeah. had something to do with it. And and who knew, according to him? Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> he does it again. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of war. He's not letting anyone off the hook here. What else? What, um, do you recognize any language here from, from other studies of slavery or anything? Look peculiar at that next. institution. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. A peculiar and powerful interest. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I think it's really interesting that when he says to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object. Um, 
in which the surgeons would rend the union even by war. I love that image, that, that his use of that word to rend the union because I always think of sort of tearing fabric or something. And He's also in the next part of that sentence <coughs> talking about, you know, I didn't say I was going to abolish slavery at the beginning. I was, I was not going to let it expand yep. the other yep. territory. It's yep. key that he says, hey, you know. Yep, other than to restrict the territorial enlargement. I, what Part of what I like about this speech also is that it sort of like gives you the whole history of the, you know, early part of the 19th century. He addresses so many issues that you can then make connections to. Um, okay, let's keep going. Neither party is connected for the war did not include the duration which was already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Okay, stop for just a second. What is he saying here? He's, he's addressing something that happened in January 1865 here. The cause of the conflict should cease before the conflict itself would cease. Does anybody know? Do you remember from down? I'm not the, sure. The Emancipation. The Emancipation, Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, that was that was in 1863. 18 January 1865, <coughs> the Congress oh, passed the 13th, 13th, 13th Amendment, mm -hmm. and so it hadn't been ratified yet. It wasn't ratified until December 1865, but it had been passed by Congress. So he lived to see that happen, and that was yet another sign that this was it was you know we were in the the end game. 